Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Can we honor the band one more time, please? Man. Um, one of the best compliments that my dad would give people, whether they were an expert in their trade or whatever it was, maybe they made the best pie, it didn't matter. One of the best compliments that he ever gave people was, it's almost like you know what you're doing, you know? <laughs> and I'll tell you that. Those guys, it's almost like they know what they're doing. Man, they, they hit the nail on the head so often. And I'm just so grateful for the way that they set up the messages that we get to experience here. Um, the first song was about joy. I mean, that's what we're talking about, being, making things new. That's what we're talking about tonight. And so I am so grateful to be here tonight. Um, we are going to be diving into a message series um, that I think is perfectly following what happened um, this past week. Who here was uh, who was here last week for um, our testimonies and our baptisms? Was anybody here for that? Man, what a powerful night! We had chips night, we had testimony, we had baptism, and um, so much of what we can see inside of what happened last week was service. Service was abundant throughout the whole night. I mean, um, the message that Joe gave was exactly about that. Not only did he talk about service, but what he did was an act of service. And what we get to experience here on a weekly basis is because of so many people that come and they serve. And it's that that really ties into the message series. And the new message series is called Give It Away. Can everybody say that, please? Give it away. Give it away. The idea is that in recovery, we say we can't keep what we don't give away. And I think Joe has kept his, um, his recovery for about 35 years, was it? Um, because he's continued in giving. He's continued in giving his testimony away. He's continued to provide um, support for people um, who are in recovery and looking for a different way of life. And for that, I am so grateful. Um, but we are going to be tackling step 12 through this message series. Um, and so if you guys would, please read with me um, step 12. It says this, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all of our affairs. And now, I, I acknowledge the fact that probably 95% percent or more of us in here tonight are not on step 12. <laughs> and so, you know, we started December, and so we're, that's the 12th month, and we're starting the 12th step. And so that's typically our program. You know, we go month by month. And so I don't move forward in thinking that, you know, there's this magic um, transition, you know, and that you're going to perfectly complete your steps in a year. No, no. Um, but what we do is we want to be able to look at a step See the principle that's behind it because a principle of a step is able to translate into any walk of recovery no matter where you are in your journey. No matter where you are in your spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ or maybe you're just opening up to the idea that Jesus may be a higher power that's worth looking into, the principle is still going to be the same. It's going to be pertinent to you in your life. And so maybe this is your first night here. And you don't really even know what I'm talking about when it comes to the 12 steps. That's okay. Or maybe you've just started the 12 steps and you're not quite there yet as you're working with your sponsor and you're navigating all these different, um, all these different challenges that these steps bring about. Um, and so you might be thinking, you know, this really isn't information that I need to hear. Maybe you've just already finished the steps and you, you have 35 years of recovery and you're like, Curtis, I heard it all, man. You know, I, I just want to um, say, guys, pay attention. Um, service is the principle behind step 12. And I don't care who you are or where you are in your journey. Service can definitely be a service to you. Um, <laughs> And the way that I had said that when I was practicing was way funnier. And so I'm just going to keep on moving. Um, and so as I begin, I want to just move on past that embarrassing moment. Um, <laughs> as I begin, I want to ask everybody. Um, you can raise your hand if this is true for you, or you can, you know, decide to keep your hand down. Have you ever been to jail? 
that's a lot more hands than I expected, guys. <laughs> but that's why we're here right now. Um, you know, there's a few of us that have been, and um, it's not a good spot. You know, it stinks. It's not just the idea, and like the idea of going to jail. It's no, it's that jail actually, it's a, the physical location stinks. Um, the food tastes bad. The people are mean. I mean, you have basically all of these people who a lot of them are experiencing the worst moment in their entire life, and they put them all into this one place. You know, like what could go wrong? Um, it's, it's, it's all of these things that just really are not good about jail, about prison, just about being incarcerated in general. But I think all of those things like food and smells and, you know, all of that stuff really comes second to what actually is just garbage about being incarcerated. And it's that you're not free anymore. (laughs) It's so obvious, but it's true. You're just not free. You don't get to choose to come and go as you please. You don't get to go to bed at the time that you want to. You don't get to watch TV whenever you feel like it. You can't really just pick up the phone and call your friends and say, hey, let's go hang out, let's go do something. Your freedoms are stripped from you. And so with that set up, I want to know, has anybody here ever felt, has anybody here just ever felt like they were in jail when you were doing your day-to-day routine? You know, Maybe it's an addiction that has claimed physical dependency over your life. You need to have it in order to function or else you're going to go through withdrawal. And so mentally you are constantly thinking about if this decision is going to negatively affect the amount of drugs that you might be able to put into your system or the amount of alcohol. Or maybe you are just so entangled into somebody else that your emotions don't even seem like they're yours anymore. And it's like you can't even make a decision without fear that this is going to upset or interrupt the person's feelings towards you. Like you don't even get to make your decision anymore. Like your freedoms have been stripped. Or maybe it's a hurt. I'm pretty sure that if I asked if anybody has been in hurt in here, everybody would raise their hand. Somebody has done something against you physically, sexually, verbally, emotionally, mentally that you never asked for and you never deserved and could never be justified. And you're just in this self-defeating thought pattern where you just affirm yourself over and over and over again that you're right, that they hurt you and that you didn't deserve it. But you never get to the solution. And you feel like you're stuck because you don't know how to move forward because you have this shame that's attached to you because of what somebody else has done to you. It's like being incarcerated while you're living your day-to-day life. Now, regardless of what has actually caused you to be here tonight, I want you to know that if this is something that you're experiencing or maybe you have experienced or maybe you're starting to feel that as I'm talking about it, I want you to know that this isn't the way that you're meant to live. In fact, you are called to live something so much greater, so much more meaningful, something that is so real and so good. And that brings me to the scripture that we have for tonight. And it is Galatians 5.13. And it says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free but do, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for tonight. God, thank you for the opportunity for us just to even meet, to have the freedom to choose that we're going to go to a place that's going to bring about good in our life. God, thank you for being in this room and being present. Lord, I pray that You open everybody's ears, you open everybody's minds, and you open everybody's hearts to the unique word that you have for them tonight. 
according to the unique relationship that you have with them. God, I pray that everybody would leave here encouraged to serve, encouraged to engage in love in a different and new way. God, I love you and I thank you. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. All right. And so um, I decided to call this uh, message the joy of good living. The joy of good living. And you may be thinking like, Curtis, it didn't sound like there was much joy in the beginning of this opening. I know that there was a lot of, um, you know, kind of negativity. Um, But what I'm here to talk about tonight is service and joy. And I want to really draw out a, a contrast between what it is to serve self and to serve someone else. To have expectations all the time. And to have no expectations. Because I think it highlights freedom and it highlights being chained to something you wish you could just let go. And so when I was looking up some stuff, I found in the 12 and 12, it says this. Understanding is the key to right principles and attitudes. And right action is the key to good living. Therefore, the joy of good living is the theme of the 12th step. And I can remember when I first started to come into the rooms, I I just was beginning to realize that I might be an addict, you know, but, you know, looking at my my history, I was able to admit that I was an addict pretty quickly. Um, You know, I would tell people, yeah, my name's Curtis and I'm an addict, but I wouldn't do anything about it. You know, the information was there, but the response wasn't. I I understood that I had a problem, but I didn't really feel that it was something that was out of control. I felt like I would have been been able to manage my addiction, that I would have been able to manage my dependency on what others thought about me. Um, And it really, uh, it's really kind of funny because I thought that even though I knew that I was an addict and that I was engaging in my addiction, that I thought my addiction didn't have to spill into any other part of my life. I didn't think that my reliance on what, my, my emotional reliance on what other people thought of me, I didn't think that that really had to spill in any other part of my life. I could go to like a meeting and I could be an addict there and I could get my recovery there and then I would leave that place and then I would continue to do everything the same and I felt like that's what recovery was. Um, I did that for a long time and it didn't work out at all. Um, when, when I asked people if they had ever been to jail, um, I was secretly raising my hand. I, um, I, th- I was working my own program, and it just led to worse and worse and worse consequences over and over and over. Um, and I can see that, you know, the reality is, is that what, I, what I'm calling my addiction, but I'm going to call my selfish ambition. When I was feeding my selfish ambition, it... It translated into every aspect of my life. I was constantly trying to serve myself through manipulating others, through lying, through just any means necessary so that I could get what I needed, regardless of the consequences that it would bring about to anybody else. And I I can see that, you know, my selfish ambition, it, it just never stayed with me the way that I wanted it to. I thought that, you know, all drugs should be legal because I was like, what's the big deal if I'm the one using it? (laughs) I'm not forcing anybody else to use it. I'm not causing any harm to anybody else when I'm using it. I'm just simply sitting at my house or my car or wherever I was, and that's what I was doing. I didn't see how it could have a negative impact on anybody else except for myself. And for some reason, I was okay with hurting myself. That's a whole different topic. Um, But it was there. And so have you guys ever heard that misery loves company? Misery loves company. Well, that definitely rang true for me. And even though I enjoyed, like, using myself, I found myself consistently engaging with other people to buy from, use with, and figure out ways to get more money so that I could continue this lifestyle. Also, while doing this, I can see that I was constantly trying to impress the people I would use with or buy from to try to make them, to try to make them seem, I wanted them to feel like I was one of them. 
And so I did all of the things that I thought that they would approve of, even though it went against everything that I actually believed in. My thoughts were so entangled in their perception of me. It was ridiculous how codependent I was for people who didn't even care anything about me. In fact, they consistently contributed to what was actually my destruction. They weren't my friends. Have you ever been so emotionally attached to someone else's emotions and thoughts that it seemed like you weren't even allowed to think your own thoughts? I mean, for me, that's where I was. I was so entangled in what other people perceived of me, whether I was trying to do good at work or in front of my mom or my grandmother, or I was in front of a drug dealer and I wanted them to think that I was as good as they were and I didn't care about anything. I was just constantly trying to pursue people's affirmation upon my life, and the affirmations that I was pursuing constantly conflicted with one another, and it always conflicted with me. And so I went out of my way to encourage other people to use so that I would be able to use with them and impress my lowly friends so that they would think highly of me. I helped people figure out lies that they could tell their parents, their spouses, their friends, their jobs, you name it, I didn't care. I just wanted them to be a part of my destruction. My misery loved company. And I can see now that I was using my freedom for selfish ambitions to feed my addiction and my codependency. And looking back, I can learn that when we use our physical freedom for selfish ambition as The Apostle Paul says, to indulge in the flesh, we build our own prison walls within us and around us. And everywhere I went, it seemed like I could never have the freedom to just enjoy my freedom. I never understood it. I didn't know why I had this constant anxiety about me. Why I would go places and I just never felt like I fit in anywhere. I was constantly searching and constantly using, trying to fill a void that could actually never be quenched or could never be filled. And so now I think about, now I want you to think about how you ended up in that daily routine that felt like or feels like a prison. Now, I imagine using your freedom to serve your personal and indulgent desires is a key ingredient. Selfish ambition is a key ingredient. And so think about this. When you are engaging in that lifestyle, do you feel free? Because I think the longer we do something like that, the less option we have when it comes to a choice. I know when people showed up at my house, there was a certain expectation on me that I felt that I had to live into. There was a certain expectation that I was going to be down to go and pick up whatever. I was going to be ready to go and say anything to anyone so that their stories could match their lies that they had been telling their spouse or their family. There was this expectation on me that I wouldn't be able to say no because if I did, then I would be different than the person that they had become friends with. And if I was different than the person they had become friends with, then I would lose their friend, my friendship and I would lose their affirmation and then I wouldn't know what to do with the emotions that I had. I would just kind of be stuck. And so a friend of mine says it this way. First, it was a toy. It was a lot of fun. Maybe you were able to get out of that person what you really wanted from them and it worked to calm your emotions and you had peace for a little while. But then it was a tool. I had so much anxiety in my life because I was abusing this toy so much that I needed to try to calm down somehow and so I used it as a tool, as a, as a way for me to relax. I remember I worked labor my whole life and so I was always... Um, either painting, working on a lawn, cutting a tree down, hauling something from place to place, and I would always work in the service industry, so I was serving tables. And so I was always tired. My feet were always tired. And I remember using the excuse, well, I'm I'm tired. I, I should be able to smoke. I'm tired. I should, you know, I just made 150 bucks in a night. It's no big deal. I'm just gonna go spend 50 of it, be responsible, 
and then I'm going to, you know, do the rest later on. It's going to be fine. I always had an excuse. It was a tool for me to use, but then it stopped becoming a tool. It stopped working. The peace that I found when I was using, the peace that I found when I was lying and trying to get people to perceive me as I, what I thought they wanted to perceive me as, wasn't any longer bringing me peace. It wasn't bringing me joy anymore. The tool stopped working, and it became a torment. So first it was a toy, then it was a tool, and then it was a torment. It was something that I lived with every day. And I'm here to tell you that there's another side to this. And that's what I really want to talk about tonight. It's not selfish ambition used for our indulgent desires, but... Let's flip this around, and we can see that the notion that what we pursue has an impact on others is also going to be true for recovery. And so when you look at your relationships, they're going to get better. When you look at the way you spend your money, it's going to become more responsible. When you look at the way that you perceive people, you're going to see them better. Your emotions, your spirituality, your physical health, your environment, the circumstances that surround you, will get better. I know I was the kind of person that didn't seem like he could ever just kind of catch a break. You know, like every time I might have had something good going for me, <laughs> like I always figured out a way to mess it up. Anytime that something good was presented to me, it was just kind of taken away without my permission. And I didn't understand how I could just be so unlucky. That's what I told myself. Curtis, you're just so unlucky. If this happened to anybody else, they would do the same things that you're doing. You know, I told myself that for a long time. And that was when I was working my own program. (laughs) That was when I was going to the meeting and then leaving and not changing anything about my life. It was when I was going to the meeting, but I never called anybody from it. It was when I was going to the meeting, but I was just sitting on my phone the whole time. It was just when I was working my own program. And so I can see that it is not only misery that loves company, it is also hope. Hope loves company. Strength. Strength loves company. And love. Love loves company. Can everybody say that with me? It's going to be fun. Ready? One, two, three. Love loves company. That's right. It's like the corniest thing that you could ever think of, but I didn't think of it. And so, (laughs) no, it's so true. Misery loves company. I was so all the time ready to pursue somebody else's destruction. I wasn't many people's friends at all. I didn't very much like offer words of warning to somebody before they would use or before they would lie to their family. I wasn't like, hey, man, you really shouldn't do that. Because if I did, they'd be like, what are you talking about? I just heard what you told your family. Like, I had no moral authority. I had nothing good, really, to offer them. I was just a connect. I was just somebody that they used for a transaction. And when I was doing my fourth step, I actually realized I was like writing down all of these names and like, yeah, that was my drug dealer and yeah, that was my, and yeah, and I realized that I didn't really have many friends. They were just a whole bunch of people that I had transactions with. And so I changed the name from friendship because I had to change the reference of what a friendship meant to transactionships. And that really helped me move on from them because that's what they were. They were transactionships. I did not have a lasting friendship with a lot of them. Not to say they were all bad, but either way. Love loves company. Um, So if this is the case, that love loves company, how does love present itself? If, if misery loves company, it was co- constantly in pursuit of a selfish ambition, how would love present itself? I think it would present itself through service, through generosity, through patience and respect and kindness. And so just as I would rally people around me to accomplish my selfish ambitions, now the love I have received from Christ and engage with by working my recovery rallies people to engage with hope. Love cannot sit idly by watching others experience hurt and hardships and pain. 
You know that pain that we're talking about, the pain that if somebody comes up to you that doesn't know you, and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. You're like, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. But when somebody does that at recovery, and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I know what that's like. That's so much different. We can't sit idly by and just watch people go through this. I love what Joe shared last week because he offered experience. He offered strength and he offered hope in recognition that he may understand a similar aspect of what you're going through. Not exactly because everybody's unique, but we understand the general idea and we know that we don't have to stay there anymore, that there's hope on the other side. And we can see people like him who are constantly engaged in service so that other people can experience the thing that was freely given to him. And so when love pours out of a person, it looks like service to others while expecting nothing in return. I feel like that's the 12th step. Whereas when we are caught up in selfish ambition, we serve ourselves through others while expecting everything in return. You know when your expectations are so high of other people that you're just constantly let down? <laughs> you can't ever actually get to enjoy the goodness that surrounds you? <laughs> I mean, you know, if we were to go through and ask pray, uh, praise reports, when we're in constant expectation of others, it's going to be really hard to find a praise report. Because somebody's always going to let you down. And more than likely... Communication isn't perfect in those moments, and so you didn't communicate what you expected of them, and then they fell short, and so now you're both frustrated with each other. That's also another topic. Um, sorry. Um, so the reward someone receives when they serve a fellow person in need with similar addiction, a similar compulsion, or a similar hurt is unspeakably beautiful. It's the beauty that brings emotional sobriety and spiritual strength. When you serve others without expectation of return from them, it places you in a different setting. A setting where you can see hope and love in real time. A setting that creates a new narrative for your life. One that speaks towards the goodness that has been chained up because of the selfish ambition that you once pursued on a daily basis. And I believe that this is the joy of living. It's in these moments of service without expectation that it really seems like God is doing for us what we never could have done for ourselves. And the beauty about our faith and recovery is that it's not just meant for me. It's not just meant for Joe. It's not just meant for you. It's meant for anybody who asks for it. Everybody has the option to engage in this. And to experience that spiritual freedom, that emotional freedom, that mental freedom where we get to experience life on life's terms and not let it beat us up on a daily basis, but instead we get to see the good and the joy that surrounds us all over the place. And I think moments like this and times like this where everybody is caught up in generosity just because of the temperature it is outside, that we get to see it in a better way. But what's available to us is that we can see it every single day on a daily basis throughout the whole year because Christ offers it to us for free and we get to work it out on a daily basis in our recovery. And so this is the joy of good living, service without expectation. And so I want to talk about the tool for tonight Think about three people that you will be able to call. Now, if you've been in the rooms for a little while, I understand you may have a lot of friends, a lot of people, a lot of accountability that you call on a you know, pretty consistent basis. I'm talking about three people. I don't want you to get lost in translation of sharing your story and having to start over with every phone call. Get some people that are familiar with your story. And I want you to call them. And I want you to pre-decide who they're going to be so that you're going to call them on a daily basis. It doesn't need to be all three, but it can be one every day and then start the rotation over. And tell them something good about them. Don't present all of the things that you're going through. 
If you find yourself in a bind, there's time to talk about it. But before you engage with, well, I can't believe he did this. And did you know that she just did that to me? Let them know three things that you love about them. Serve them verbally. And just let them know that you appreciate what they're doing. Because my challenge to you is that I think you're going to experience something that I personally have experienced. And that is being caught up in a mindset that selfish ambition. I need to get better right now and you're the one that's going to fix it for me. To a different setting of, hey, did you know that every time you say this in that meeting, it just makes me feel so much better? I love that you come every week. I can always count on you. And I am so grateful for you. Or it could be something like, you are living the life that I want. And I really appreciate you sharing your experience, strength, and hope with me because now I have a destination to go to. The idea is that we are removing ourselves from the mental obsession of selfish ambition and placing ourselves in a new setting. A new place that we get to experience in a new way. That doesn't mean your problem is insignificant. That doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. What I'm saying is that try to put yourself in a different mental capacity before you get there. And let somebody know three things that you love about them. And so as we close tonight, I'm going to ask you guys, enjoy the Jupiter Donuts that we have waiting for you at Connection Cafe. That's right. I thought it was, some people were going to be like, what, Jupiter Donuts? That's what's up. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, enjoy the Jupiter Donuts. But what I want you guys to enjoy is each other. Share some good time. Share some phone numbers. And plan on calling. Pre-decide. It's not when I'm in the moment. It's a pre-decision to say that this is who I'm going to call regardless of the good that's happening or the bad that's happening but I am going to bless somebody with my words. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for tonight. God, thank you for the encouragement you provide. God, thank you for the sacrifice you made on the cross. Lord, if there's anybody in here tonight that doesn't know you, I ask that in this moment they they would say these words. God, I love you and I thank you. I accept that I'm a sinner and in need of forgiveness. Jesus, I commit my life to you because of the work you've done on the cross and because of the resurrection you have from the grave. God, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, I will pursue your goodwill for my life throughout my life. I love you and I thank you. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you so much, Curtis. That was so good. There were so many nuggets. It was a hard time picking which one I wanted to talk about. (laughs) But in the very beginning, you said something that made me think to myself, what makes me feel imprisoned? Um, And for me, that's anger, rage, fear, denial, perfectionism, self-pity, unhealthy relationships, and codependency as a whole. And it was pretty hard to to feel all of those, but then eventually I found freedom, little by little, and I found that through Jesus, and I found that through Celebrate Recovery. And there were still times, though, even though I felt freedom, it was awesome, there were still times that it was hard to still walk through these doors. There was bad days, there was distractions, there was I'm too busy, there was life, there was whatever it was. But then I started serving, and there was times that I couldn't back out because I couldn't leave everyone else hanging, right? (laughs) So it held me accountable, and it kept me coming back. And eventually, it got me to a point where I was excited to come back, especially on my bad days. I was excited to come back, because I knew that I would show up, and somebody would say something, or multiple people would say multiple things, that would be like, that's exactly what I needed. So that's why I keep coming back. And I urge you, if you are not serving yet, find a place to plug in, coffee, doors, cleanup, whatever it is, just say hello, a handshake, find a place to give back. It'll keep you coming back. It helped me. Um, And that's all I have. But (laughs) thanks for that message, Curtis. That was great. Um, So we're going to move into a time of closing now. 
Um, and if you also on giving back, if you would like to donate, that's a way to serve. That's a way to give back. You can do that by texting 77977. You can do that on the app I mentioned earlier or in person. Um, and then I also want you to know that we have our recovery meetings on my left, your right is uh, men's codependency, sorry, open share and chemical dependency. On my right, your left is women's open share and chemical dependency. So if you'll now please stand with me and we will close with the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Get hope.